I stand here before you to reiterate the condolences from my Prime Minister Imran Khan, from my Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi, from the entire nation and country of Pakistan, which stands shoulder to shoulder with you in this hour of grief, in this time when our hearts are bleeding because of the atrocity that has befallen this wonderful, marvelous family. Pakistan's ambassador to Canada spoke at the public funeral for the Afzal family in London yesterday. They were killed one week ago, targeted for being Muslim. The family immigrated to Canada from Pakistan, and they are being mourn mourned in that country as well. The prime minister of Pakistan spoke out about the attack, and I spoke with him earlier. Prime Minister Khan, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. Uh, you tweeted about the, the killing of the four members of the Afzal family this week. Why did you want to speak out about it, sir? Well, listen, Rosemary, I have spent a lot of my time in Western countries. I have spent half my, I used to, when I used to play professional cricket, I used to spend half my year in, in England. I went to university there. I got married there. I got boys there. So I understand the Western culture. And I also, I understand um, wh where the problems are. How come this Islamophobia is growing and specifically after 9-11? There are two landmark uh, dates from where Islam, uh, Islamophobia has grown. One was Salman Rushdie's book in 1989, roughly. And secondly, it was after 9-11. And how did, how did this division the suspicion take place. After 9-11, the word Islamic terrorism, Islamic radicalism. Now, when these terms started uh, becoming currency and announced by Western leaders, the man in the street does not understand. When you say Islamic radicals, uh, it seems that there's something in the religion that makes people radical. And the man in the street cannot distinguish between a moderate Muslim and a radical Muslim. Terrorism has no religion. They are, in every human society, they're extremists. Uh, they are liberals, they're extremists, and bulk of the people are moderates. Well, I was just going to say, though, you, you've talked about this at the United Nations and, and many other places about a need for a holistic approach by the international community. What, what does that mean to you practically, Prime Minister? What do you need to see there? So my whole, I've been, uh, every forum, uh, I've been trying to say this because the two, you know, communities, Muslims living in Western world, they are the ones who suffer from Islamophobia. And then they suffer, I mean, regular, uh, we, we hear about incidents, a lot of incidents don't get reported, but we know about it, our embassies tell us. So, so this, this gap needs to be closed. In this instance, it appears it was uh, one person uh, radicalized in some way on his own who did this. W what is it that government should be doing, for instance, to shut down online hate toward Muslims? I think there should be a very strict action against it, this, because, you see, these uh, hate uh, websites, which, which, again, as I said, would divide, divide humanity by creating hatred, ignorant about the other human community and you you target them and and, and uh, uh, this hate material and especially with the growing social media uh, and social media is a, is a completely you know the world is just coming to grips with it because it's a new phenomenon uh, and and unfortunately i mean while while there are so many benefits of social media it's changing the whole world but this one particular bit when there are these hate websites which uh, which create hatred amongst human beings. There should be an international action against them. And and what would that look like to you, Prime Minister? What would be the, the mechanism for doing that, if you will? Whenever the international community, and by that I mean the world community, the world leaders, whenever they decide upon taking action, this will be dealt with. The problem is at the moment there is not enough motivation. The, the, some international leaders or uh, leaders in the Western countries actually don't don't understand this phenomena. They too think that the Muslims are these weird people who have these weird customs, 
uh, and they need to be uh, uh, put in place. So it just needs to be brought together and there has to be understanding. And this yeah. can be promoted by world leaders. Do you plan to reach out to Justin Trudeau to have a conversation about this? Yes, I will. Uh, I've, I've had previous conversations with Justin Trudeau as well. And I have to say we mostly agree with, uh, with most things. You, you may be aware, too, of a law in the province of Quebec here that bans public servants, teachers, judges and others from wearing visible religious symbols, which obviously affects Muslims who wear the hijab, for instance. Quebec says this is a law about secularism. What do you make of that kind of law existing in, in Canada? I find this, you know, secular extremism. It really is uh, against, you see, the whole idea about sec idea behind secularism is liberalism. You want humans to basically, uh, you know, be free to express the way they want to be, as long as it doesn't cause pain and hurt to other human beings. You know, that's how I understood, uh, understand what liberalism is. So if someone covers their hair, uh, their head, why has it become such a big issue? And I feel this is just a symptom. The, the, the main reason behind this becoming such a ish, big issue is because of the way Islam is perceived. And that's why that understanding has to take place. And I also say one thing, Rosemary, that Muslim world also must, uh, heads of Muslim states, must be able to present their cases in world forums like the United Nations and the European Union. So, that, so, so to improve this understanding, and I actually do, you know, people objecting to hijab uh, or, you know, sometimes, I mean, people with beards, although beards are now becoming very trendy, all the shorter ones. So uh, people objecting to this is quite bizarre for me because, you know, and again, I repeat, in the liberal Western democracies, why is this such a big issue? Unless the reason behind it is that there's actually fear of, of the other. There's a suspicion, you know, they actually do believe that there's something in Islam that leads to radicalism and to extremism and to terrorism. And unfortunately, I repeat again, there are certain Western leaders who believe this. Right. You, you are speaking about Islam writ large, of course, but as you know, it, it is very diverse. There are many different groups of Muslims in the world. You have previously said, sir, that you are not aware of events happening in Xinjiang province in China. Canada's parliament has said what, what's happening to the Muslim minority Uyghurs there is a genocide. Why do you not advocate for those Muslims as you do for Muslims elsewhere? Um, let me just uh, be clear, Rosemary. Number one, Islamophobia does not affect us Muslims living in Muslim countries. It only affects Muslim in Western countries. And because I know and spend time in Western uh, uh, society, I understand what they go through. So that's why I raise my voice. Now, as for what is the situation of Muslims all over the world, you know, I mean, just look at the situation from Libya, you go, come to Syria, to Iraq, to Afghanistan, to Somalia. I mean, so there is a serious political problem in the Muslim world uh, and, and suffering. Yeah, I, I understand that, Prime Minister, but you have deep economic ties with China and it would appear that Muslims are being detained and abused in China. Does that not concern you? Uh, you see, the, our relationship with China is such that whatever uh, issues we raise with China are always, uh, uh, you know, behind closed doors. Because Chinese society is such and we respect them. I mean, we have uh, economic ties with China. It's our, he's, uh, China is our neighbor. They've, they've been very good to us in our most difficult times. So we respect the fact that if we have concerns, we talk about behind closed doors. Just to end again on, Prime Minister, on what happened in Canada with the Afsal family. As you know, there, there's a nine-year-old boy that, that did survive the attack. He's in hospital. That family has many friends in the community. What would you say to their remaining family and friends after this event? Uh, I must say everyone is shocked in this country because, you know, we saw their family picture. And so, you know, a family being... Uh, targeted like that has had a deep impact in Pakistan. Um, we have our embassy in, in Canada is in touch with uh, 
uh, the, the the other family members we are trying to work out what's the best what we can do for them uh, and we will come up with some sort of a solution uh, you know a foreign office we're all in touch and we're working out but at the moment we are still in a state of shock because it is you know when you when that happens you immediately start thinking about your own family yeah. and you sort of worry about everyone gone and just one boy left so uh, we'll work out Prime Minister, thank you so much for your time today. I do appreciate it, sir. Thank you. It's worth pointing out that Pakistan has also been criticized for its treatment of its own religious minorities, including the Ahmadis. According to Human Rights Watch, there have been at least five apparently targeted killings of members of the Ahmadi community since July 2020, and only two arrests. Amnesty International has called on Pakistan to end its persecution of the Ahmadis, whose rights to freedoms of religion and belief are not respected by state law. Of course, that would include the Prime Minister.